from the University of California, Irvine. This is UCI Minds Spotlight on Care, the podcast where we share stories, experiences, tips, and advice on caring for loved ones affected by Alzheimer's and other dementias. Hello, and welcome to Spotlight on Care. I'm Virginia Nave, and I'm here with my co-host, Steve O'Leary. Today, our special guest is going to talk about some helpful information regarding doctor visits and medication management for your loved one with dementia. Since both Steve and I have personal experience in caregiving, we like to share something we've learned before we introduce our guest. So Steve, do you have any helpful tips regarding doctor visits and medication management that you learned when you took care of your wife, Patty? Yeah, Virginia, that, that, that's always an interesting challenge. Um, you know, I, I think of the doctor visits as um, an opportunity to kind of reinforce something. Um, I, I was very blessed to have Patty accept her disease. I, I know that some of our listeners are dealing with the issue about acceptance and denial. And fortunately, early diagnosis, I think, played a role. But I think also that doctor visits that we continue to have on a regular basis with a neurologist and also with the, the, the clinical trials we were participating in, um, I think reinforce the whole role of doctor visits. So for me, uh, it was, hey, we have another doctor visit coming up. And, and Patty would go, uh, okay, where? And Fortunately, we moved down to UCI Mine from UCLA, and that made life a lot easier. But she sort of looked forward to these visits. Um, And I think it also has something to do with the quality of the physician and the knowledge that they have of dealing with the disease. Um, We found even when she was going to visit, uh, she had some other internal issues, and she was dealing with with her GP and with a... uh, another specialty doctor, and they knew that she had the disease because she'd been upfront about it. And so they had that kind of cautionary, helpful hand. And that would be a piece of advice I would offer is don't be afraid to share your wife or your loved one's um, issues with any physician prior to going in to see them. It's really a value to the doctor I think they understand, oh, okay, now I need to apply this kind of an approach to it. So for me, um, being upfront about doctor visits, talking about them, seeing it as a resource, and even reinforcing it with Patty, even if she wouldn't remember, I would go over, hey, here's what we learned today. Here's why that was a value. So I don't know if it helped every time, but it just seemed like we made we made going to the doctor part of dealing with the disease. And I think that that helped her and certainly helped me. Thank you, Steve. I remember so many times being frustrated after taking mom to a doctor. I never took her without a good reason for being there. So when the doctor would come in and look at her and ask her what the problem was, I knew we were going to have difficulty. I I knew he was trying to be polite, but what I wanted him to understand was why we were there. And he would say, well, hello, how are you, Helen? And she would say, just fine. Thank you. How are you? (laughs) That's when I knew, oh, I've got to get his attention. I've got to get his eyes. Anyway, that's my story. Um, Our guest today can talk about anything relating to dementia caregiving, and I'm sure we will have her back many times to talk about various topics. Her name is Kim Bailey. Kim has a Master of Science degree in gerontology and has worked in the field for 30 years. She's currently the Program and Education Specialist with Alzheimer's Orange County. In the past, Kim was the Director of Community Relations and Development for UCI's ADRC. Along with being a professional in the field and previously an adjunct faculty college professor, Kim has also been a personal in-home caregiver to a woman with Alzheimer's disease. 
she knows whereof she speaks. <laughs> Welcome, Kim. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Virginia. I'm so pleased to be here on the show with you and Steve and uh, to have a chance to chat with all of the viewers. Well, I know that you're going to be uh, giving us really, really good information. Let's start with preparation for the doctor appointment. Let's say your loved one with Alzheimer's or other dementia has a medical issue and needs to be seen by a physician. It's fairly straightforward if the person you're caring for doesn't have dementia, but it can be quite the ordeal if they do. Kim, help us understand the preparation for that doctor appointment. Mm, yeah, preparation is critical, especially in today's healthcare environment, because as we all know, uh, we have to really maximize the limited time that we have available uh, in that office. Uh, I understand that nowadays, the average length of a visit to the doctor's office is about 10 minutes. Uh, I know. Ugh. So while that can vary widely, we want to really make sure that we make the most of our time with doctors. So I always advise that uh, we make a list of our top concerns before we go in. Uh, even if it's just jotting down, let's say, three top priorities on a post-it note. Mm -hmm. That way you avoid that whole parking lot syndrome where you get out of the office and you're out in the parking lot getting in your car and you, you know, say, oh my gosh, I totally forgot to ask the doctor about this important matter. Uh, I had a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We, I think we all get a little nervous. We get that mm -hmm. white coat syndrome in the doctor's office. So do make that list of questions and concerns, those top questions and concern. And then um, also keeping a record of changes, I think, can be very uh, helpful when you're caring for someone with dementia. Uh, having a, a list of all medications, and that includes over-the-counter supplements, et cetera, and making sure that that's always uh, kept up to date, uh, having that with you, scheduling appointments for your loved one at what you consider to be their best time of day. I hadn't thought about that, but that's really a good idea. Some people are not morning people. They do better in the afternoon and some are completely opposite. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, for a lot of people with dementia, they're, they're really more uh, alert and lucid in the morning, late morning. As the day wears on and they get closer to the late afternoon, they might go into sundowning. So think of, take, take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, make sure that your loved one has their hearing aids in if they wear hearing aids, uh, wearing their glasses. Um, what else can you do to prepare? Uh, expect resistance. Most people don't want to go to the doctor. They don't want to leave the house. They're going to probably tell you there's nothing wrong with them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had a lot of, why are we going to the doctor? <laughs> yep. And keep your response to that limited, brief and low key. Just something like, uh, it's just a checkup. And afterwards, we can go to lunch at your favorite restaurant. Yeah. Those are just a few tips. <laughs> Oh, I I know it sounds easy to take someone to the doctor, but with dementia, it's just, uh, it's got its complications. So you've arrived and you're at the doctor's office and you're, you're, you check in and you're told to have a seat. Mm -hmm. Okay. We all know that waiting is just part of it. Right. Do you have any suggestions about making the waiting room experience less painful if your loved one really doesn't want to be there? Right. And as we said, they generally don't. So bring along something to keep them occupied. Uh, I used to bring, um, I had a little packet of my uh, friend's favorite photos. Ah, uh, actually, they were her wedding photos. And we had a, okay. a little mini album with her wedding photos in it. And so we would pour over those while we were waiting. And she would tell me all about her wedding day, which, of, yes. which of course, I'd heard, 
you know, a hundred times before. But of course. <laughs> it was one, every time was the first time. Every time was the first time, and it was a favorite activity. Um, or you can bring yeah. a little snack. Uh, I'm not sure you can do that now with COVID. Um, oh, maybe not. Maybe not. But even if you have like a, a little puzzle or something that they can do to distract uh-huh. them, try to bring something that's a distraction. Yeah, I never, I hadn't thought about that when I was caregiving for mom, but that would have been a really good idea. Yeah. You are called in and ushered back to the exam room. And you are again waiting. (laughs) The nurse comes in to take blood pressure, temperature. And I remember at that point always praying that they were not going to ask for a urine sample. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They did a few times, and it's not easy. Right. But anyway, the doctor enters. What advice do you have to make sure the appointment goes well, since, of course, their time is now so limited? If you have the type of relationship with the physician that permits you to communicate in advance by some mechanism, uh, such as email, Uh, that is great because you can get the gist of the concern, the reason for the visit, across to him or her in advance. Um, Alzheimer's Orange County also has a tracking document where you track changes and put your top concerns into that document. If you have something like that that you could email in advance, that would be great. You're not able to do that with all physicians, but... Anything you can convey in advance is fantastic, but, you know, that doesn't always work. But if you can do that, I think that, that that's really great. And I wanted to mention, too, Virginia, about the urine sample. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, yeah. My person's PCP gave me the urine, the cup, the specimen cup oh. at every visit, and I was able to collect that at home. And bring, uh, and bring it with me. Well, that would have been helpful. Yeah. And that can, because it just didn't work in the doctor's office. She just wasn't no. able to do that. So I wanted to mention that too. So you know, I remember one time it just wasn't working and they kind of gave up and yeah. I, I didn't know yeah. what else to do. <laughs> but I want you to tell your story about how you communicated in the uh, exam room with the doctor, because I think it's wonderful. Okay, so, you know, the doctor either, they tend to do one of two things. They either start talking to the patient directly, which is what you were talking about earlier, or they sometimes just talk to the caregiver, which is awful also. Because, I mean, when they talk to the patient, the patient isn't able to respond appropriately. So that's bad. Right. And when they talk to you, then the patient gets mad. So you're sort of in a really bad situation, no matter how you look at it. But yeah, in our case, the doctor would talk directly to um, my, to the patient, and she would give false answers. But what I did was I tended to stand, either stand behind her or be seated behind her with my arm across her shoulder. Okay. And so when he would ask a question like, have you had any falls lately? She would answer no. And I would hold up like two fingers behind her. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. And and he saw you because you were right behind her. Right. I was either, as I said, standing behind her or I had my arm across her shoulders and I could off to the side because she really had no nose no peripheral vision right. okay. at that point. Okay. So I would do whatever I could to mimic or pantomime answers uh, without her seeing. And the reason that's so important is when you correct them outright. And I have had to do that sometimes, like in the ER, because sometimes it's just unavoidable. Yeah. What you yeah. do is you just destroy their dignity. And it, you know, and it's just, we want to be as open and honest as possible while maintaining their dignity. And we are in the doctor's office. We have to get these issues explained correctly, but we have to do everything we can to preserve their dignity at the same time. So I just had, I just found my, that was the best way for me to try and do that. 
She had absolutely no wherewithal. I mean, I, I had her in the ER one time, and she had a gaping head wound. And the doctor was uh, asking her questions, and she said, I don't know why I'm here. Ask her. She's the reason I'm here. You know, and she was very indignant. And, you know, I mean, it's just this is what this disease does to people. They're just yeah. so unaware. So it's oh, really e- very sad. Completely. Yeah. And it's, it's tough. And, and because- that was from a fall, by the way just in case the the listeners are thinking, how did she get a gaping head wound? (laughs) It was unfortunately from a fall. Of course it was. She forgot about the fall within minutes. You know, she had no idea why she was in the ambulance or in the hospital. But um, Exactly. And blamed me. Exactly. And (laughs) sometimes I wonder, you know, if the doctors really get a lot of these situations. They don't. And the... Neither do the hospital personnel, you know, and they 100% keep it. agree. Yeah. yeah. So, but we do what we can with training. Yeah. Did you take a did you take a notepad with you for taking notes? Yes. Always take notes uh, or even record the sessions. That's an idea. Yeah, on your cell phone because mm-hmm. uh, and you just tell doctors so they don't become defensive. Um, right. And they should invite that. Because, and if you don't understand what they're saying when they're speaking doctorese, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's high level and for a lay person and you just keep asking questions until you understand, you know, Absolutely. and record it all. And Okay, we're going to go on now to medication management issues. Um, I first realized that my mom could not be trusted to manage medications by herself when I went to visit her and took a look at her seven-day sample pill pack of Aricept, you know, with the bubbles and you pop the pill out, Monday, Tuesday, whatever it was, uh, that the doctor had given her the day before. And the pill pack was empty. I said, On Tuesday. Mom? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said, Mom, um, where, where are the pills? And she looked at me and she said, I took them. Yeah. And I went, oh, my God, I went to I went into a panic and I I called the doctor's office and they found the doctor who was not in that day, but they found him and he called me back and and I said, am I supposed to run her to the emergency room? And he said, no, no, but she might not feel very good tonight. And I thought, "Okay, so this isn't working. You know, this is her, she needs a thyroid pill every day. This just isn't working. So tell us how best to handle medications. So this needs to be regarded as a safety issue. And so, um, unfortunately, you know, we deal with this all the time with many of our families and caregivers are often very reluctant to take this job away from their loved ones who have been doing yeah. this independently for years. But it must be done. I mean, we have to monitor their medications because it's all too easy to uh, miss a dose or take too many, as was the case with your mother. And mm-hmm. so... Um, it just has to be done. And, you know, the first thing that needs to be done is to use pill dispensers. Okay. Um, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, so that you can clearly see what you're doing. You have to have those great lists. You know, by the way, make sure all of the medications that your loved one is taking are needed and that they don't conflict with one another. I mean, we've been telling people for 100 years, you know, take all everything to the doctor, if necessary, in a paper bag, everything. And make sure that all these drugs are necessary. Right. They're not um, conflicting with one another. And then keep these medications up to date and keep that list maintained Keep them in pill dispensers, and if necessary, hide those dispensers. Put them up out of reach. Put them in a locked cabinet. 
um, you know, it's it's going to be an unpopular decision, perhaps, <laughs> but we have to make unpopular decisions in the interests of keeping our loved ones safe. And when it's true, when, yeah. And I mean, when it's like the driving issue, it's like people get mad, but right. we have to weigh on the side of safety. So it's um, a safety issue. Yeah, and when we are giving pills to our loved one um, and we know we think we're going to encounter resistance, we want to make sure we give the um, what we call the life-sustaining medications first in case they just refuse, start to refuse. Okay. So, um, you know, like the heart medication or, okay. the col- you know, things that they are essential like blood thinners or whatever i'm not a doctor by the way so here's my disclaimer <laughs> with this medication advice you know <laughs> but um yeah and then um if they don't if they're really being resistant sometimes we can hide the pills or crush them into food but it's critical that we find out from the doctor or a pharmacist if the pills are cru- are intended to be crushed, because some pills some, you cannot. Some, okay. Yeah, sometimes it's really imperative that you find out whether certain pills yeah. can and they can't. And so, right. um, yeah. Yeah, but you, right. the, the important message I want to get across is that you have to get these pills away from people who are no longer competent to take their own medication. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned... Um, how you approach someone and what kind of attitude you go into the pill taking moment. Yes. Yes. What do you suggest? Yeah. Well, it's like standing, I'll tell you what you should not do first. Okay. (laughs) Like standing over someone, you know, hovering over them and in an authoritarian stance and saying, all right, it's time to take your pills. Take them. Let's not make this a big deal. Not a good idea to give orders. (laughs) Right. Uh, You know, coming alongside someone, sitting sitting down beside them, maybe bring your own pills over and say, you know, honey, it's time for us to take our pills. It's pill taking time. That might work, Mm -hmm. but your approach should be low key and... um, you know, your body language should be open and, you know, speak slowly and clearly with a gentle voice and a gentle affect about you. Um, if they're, have, have them ready, have the water ready. Um, okay. And so in some cases, when we have resistance, a note from the doctor is very effective, um, uh, or okay, he, so you can say, "Oh, the doc, look, look here. The doctor wrote you a note yeah. and said you need to do this." Okay. Yeah, you can use that note, Virginia, when they say to you, which they often do, "I don't need any pills. There's nothing wrong with me." Oh, absolutely. My mom was <laughs> very proud. And of then the you fact can that. say, "Well, you are very healthy," because you never want right. to say they're wrong. So you right. can agree with them and say, "You know, you're right. You're very healthy." Nevertheless. Mm-hmm. Doctor says that you right. need these pills for your blood pressure. Look, I've got a note from him. So, okay. I mean, it's it's so hard being a caregiver. You know, it is the most difficult mm. job in the world. And really, uh, it's, it's, it's tough. People and every day knew. can be different. But the more tools in your tool belt, I always say, the more tools in your tool belt, the better, mm-hmm. you know, equipped you're going to be. And sometimes a tool like a note you know, from the physician on a... I was thinking maybe ad. even a note from a grandchild. Oh, a favorite um, grandchild. That's a great idea. A favorite idea. grandchild. That's a great idea, Virginia. Yeah. Right, right. And just put it right in front of them and say, now it's fine. So, but when you think about it, yeah. that poor caregiver, this has to happen every day. Yeah, it's that's tough. It's, that's really tough. It's really tough. Mm-hmm. That's why, you know, really less is best. I mean... Um, that's why yeah. really a great geriatrician will mm-hmm. figure out if all of these pills are really necessary. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So when I was thinking about this whole topic the other day, I was reminded that it's not just a regular doctor that you go see with somebody. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's the dentist. There's the there's the eye doctor. 
There's the doctor regarding hearing aids. Um, my mom broke her glasses one day. I didn't have any idea who her eye doctor was, um, and she couldn't tell me. Mm-hmm. And then I found out that you can't just go get a new pair of prescription glasses because the prescriptions expire uh, one to two years generally in most states. So I was stuck with having to take her to the eye doctor and having them put the big machines in front of her face. It was a mess. Yeah. Do you have any advice uh, regarding that type of a visit? I do. I do. We actually, at Alzheimer's Orange County, we have um, identified dentists and other types of services that are thought to be more dementia friendly. Oh, that's excellent. And so um, listeners can call our helpline to get those referrals. They can consult um, through our website um, or call the helpline at one 844 Three seven three four four zero zero. Lovely. Um, yes, because you have lots of um, good information. I remember um, hiring a, a dentist, a mobile dentist, to come to the assisted living facility where my mom was. And it, it looked pretty scary, but you know what? She did pretty well. And of course, she was home, Virginia. So, you know, just being in her home setting, you Ah. know, half the problem with going out to the doctor or going out to the dentist or the eye doctor is just going out. Uh You know, they they get so fearful of leaving the comfort zone. So um, anytime you can have a, a practitioner come to them. That's, that's half the battle. It really is. Um, and then, you know, just again with the, the approach and the body language and helping people to stay calm and distracting them with, you know, as soon as this is over, we're going to have some ice cream or... Yes. You know, you take... Let's go have lunch. Or just offering them something you know they love, you know. That, yes. Just adopting sort of a person-centered approach. Yes, you have to be aware of what, you know, makes your loved one comfortable and happy again. And if they're anything like my mom, it didn't take her long to forget what had happened during that appointment. And that's the positive side of this whole ordeal. Absolutely. Okay, well, Kim, we can't really thank you enough for being with us today, (laughs) for sharing this uh, really helpful information. And I I must say that if I read your entire bio at the beginning, uh, we wouldn't have had time for this interview. (laughs) So thank you for all of your experience and for all of your advice. And I hope we can call you again uh, for some info on, on topics we need to know about. And we hope you'll come back soon. Oh, I'd love to come back and visit with you again, Virginia and Steve. Sure. And to our audience, thank you for listening today. And please join us again soon on Spotlight on Care. Spotlight on Care is produced by the University of California, Irvine Institute for Memory Impairments and Neurological Disorders, UCI Mind. Interviews focus on personal caregiving journeys and may not represent the views of UCI Mind. Individuals concerned about cognitive disorders prevention, or treatment should seek expert diagnosis and care. Please subscribe to the Spotlight on Care podcast wherever you listen. For more information, visit mind.uci.edu.